Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much for joining us for today's AUKUS Defense Minister's Joint Press Briefing. It is my pleasure to introduce U.S. Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin III, Australia Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of Defense Richard Marles, and the United Kingdom Secretary of State for Defense Grant Shapps. Each of the ministers will deliver opening remarks and then we'll have time to take a few questions. Please note that I will moderate those questions and call on journalists. Uh, with that, uh, Secretary Austin, the floor is yours, sir. Thanks, Patrick. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, let me start by thanking Deputy Prime Minister Marles and Secretary Shops for coming to California for our second AUKUS Defense Ministerial Meeting. And it was definitely worth the trip. We had a very productive and wide-ranging session, and today, uh, just underscore that AUKUS is a once-in-a-generation opportunity that will promote peace and security throughout the Indo-Pacific. The Department remains deeply focused on the Indo-Pacific, and AUKUS underscores that fact. For more than two years, our defense forces, industries, and scientific communities have led this historic endeavor. In March, our three democracies boldly launched the optimal pathway for Australia to acquire conventionally armed nuclear-powered submarines. And today we highlighted the important progress that we've made to see that plan through. I'm very proud of the sailors from our three countries who are seamlessly training together across our trilateral partnership. This year, six officers from the Royal Australian Navy graduated from U.S. Nuclear Power School, and more are on track to graduate in early 2024. Now, these proud officers and sailors will be the first to operate Australia's conventionally armed nuclear-powered submarines. As part of the optimal pathway, we're also working to increase the frequency of U.S. SSN port visits to Australia. This directly supports President Biden's commitment to ensure that Australia acquires this new submarine capability at the earliest possible date while meeting the highest standard of nuclear nonproliferation. The ministers and I also reviewed our, ma our major accomplishments within the crucial second pillar of AUKUS. And through Pillar 2, we have leveraged our respective defense innovation and industry sectors to develop and deliver advanced capabilities so that our warfighters can hear, see, and act with decisive advantage. We're innovating with cutting-edge tech in several areas, including artificial intelligence, electronic warfare, and quantum technology. And by implementing strong standards of technology protection, we are reducing barriers to sharing information and technology. And we're streamlining our processes to deliver these capabilities and lead our partnership forward for the next generation. Today, we endorse several new efforts under Pillar 2 of office. Let me highlight two of these efforts. The first is a maritime autonomous experimentation and exercise series. Beginning next year, our three countries will conduct a series of integrated trilateral experiments and exercises. They will enhance capability development, improve our interoperability, and rapidly accelerate the sophistication and scale of autonomous maritime systems that we can deploy and operate together. The second is an AUKUS Innovation Challenge Series. That will mean that companies from across our three countries can compete for a common innovation challenge prize that will help our warfighters improve interoperability, gain decision advantage, and strengthen our deterrence. Now, these challenges will begin in early 2024 with a prize challenge focusing on electronic warfare. Again and again, AUKUS proves that we are stronger together. And every day, we move closer to our shared vision of a free and open Indo-Pacific. 
So Deputy Prime Minister Marles and Secretary Shops, I'm truly grateful for your leadership and your friendship and for everything that you're doing for our shared security. And I look forward to strengthening our partnership even further and to building a more secure future together. Richard? Well, thank you, Lloyd. Uh, thank you for hosting us here today. And it is great to see you. And it is great to see you, Grant, uh, here in California. And we have had a very productive day uh, in this trilateral AUKUS Defence Ministers meeting. And as we reflect today on what has happened in the last 12 months since we met as a group in Washington DC in December of last year, it has been a truly momentous year where there has been an enormous amount of progress, uh, particularly in respect of Australia acquiring a nuclear powered submarine capability with the help of the United States and the United Kingdom under Pillar 1 of AUKUS. Uh, in March uh, of this year, we saw the announcement of the pathway by which this would be achieved, uh, which was a breakthrough moment in terms of Australia's defence capability. And since then, we've seen the standing up of the Australian Submarine Agency. We have seen the commencement of infrastructure work. We have seen Australians undertake training, both submariners and defence industry workers. Uh, here in the United States, as, Gra uh, as Lloyd mentioned, uh, at the Nuclear Power School, but also in the United Kingdom. Um, we have seen, importantly, the legislative work proceed to enable this to happen in both of our countries. We've seen the frequency, as we promised back in March, of uh, visits of the United States nuclear-powered submarines happen to Australia. Indeed, in the last 12 months, we've seen the USS Mississippi, the USS Asheville and the USS North Carolina visit uh, our country. Uh, and we look forward in the future to uh, seeing more of those visits, including visits of astute class submarines from the United Kingdom. But as we reflect on that uh, year past, we are also making very important announcements today about the future in respect of uh, Pillar 1. Um, next year, we'll see uh, the most significant maintenance occur in Australia of a United States nuclear-powered submarine, uh, which we plan to happen in the third quarter of next year, which will crystallise the development that needs to be occurring in terms of both infrastructure and skills within our workforce and our submariner base. Um, so we are really pleased about the progress in respect of all of that, and it is uh, an enormous amount of work which has occurred over the course of the last 12 months. But significantly in terms of today's meeting, it is actually Pillar 2 uh, which has taken uh, centre stage. Uh, and indeed, I think today's meeting will be regarded as a critical moment in the history of Pillar 2 of AUKUS, and that is the sharing and development of advanced technologies between our three countries. We're putting in place um, the architecture which will enable that to happen through uh, the International Joint Requirement Oversight Council, uh, which will give a uh, joint capacity to look at the technologies which we, with which we are pursuing. Um, our armaments directors will be working together with a tabletop exercise next year. And as Lloyd mentioned, um, our innovation organisations, the Defence Innovation Unit, uh, of both the United States and the United Kingdom, along with the Australian Strategic Capabilities Accelerator, uh, working together on joint challenges, uh, which we'll see initially that happen in the space of electronic warfare. Um, and again, the legislative environment, which is being worked on um, in our <coughs> countries, is creating a seamless defence industrial base between the United States, Australia and the United Kingdom, which is so essential to seeing AUKUS Pillar 2 uh, become operational. But in terms of that architecture, today we are backing it up with practical first steps, where, pre where, where specific technologies are being worked on. Uh, and we are announcing a significant number of those today, which include uh, work on uh, quantum clock, which includes the uh, deep space advanced radar capability in our three countries and includes resilient artificial intelligence which in turn will give rise to resilient precision targeting. 
All of these are practical steps forward which come on the back of an architecture which has been established today in relation to Pillar 2. And I think when we look back at the significance of today's meeting, we will see this as the critical meeting uh, which uh, was a watershed in the progress of Pillar 2 of AUKUS. Um, across all of our work, uh, Pillar 1 and Pillar 2, uh, across the friendships that exist between the three of us personally, what is really clear is that uh, AUKUS represents a powerful combination of countries working together which is sending a really important message to the world. I think all of us have remarked on the fact that uh, together when we are meeting, when we are discussing these technologies, when we are taking these steps down the path, each of our countries is much stronger. Thank you very much, <coughs> uh, Lloyd, Richard. Um, it's 80 years since the U.S. Navy uh, shot down an en enemy dive bomber off Cape Hunter on the south coast of Guadalcanal. Uh, nothing particularly unusual. It was the Second World War uh, going on at the time. But what was remarkable that, about that particular Navy destroy uh, was that the fighter, uh, the actual uh, missile that hit it, hit it without a direct hit. It missed, in effect. So this was actually a piece of fatal artillery uh, that had destroyed uh, that particular item, but the shell itself was revolutionary because the 15 centimeter fuse was capable of de detonating when it was close to the target. So in a sense, it missed, but it also hit. The tiny proximity fuse uh, not only helped win that particular battle, but it also helped turn the tide of the <laughs> war. And this miniature miracle was only possible because of a different type of fusion, and that was, you guessed it, between Australia, the UK, and the United States. And it was actually developed by a brilliant Australian scientist called William Butman, who was in London developing it, and the fuse was then transferred to the United States, where it turned into this tremendous game changer. Today, in a much more dangerous world, with Russia waging war in Ukraine, with Hamas wreaking havoc in the Middle East, China undermining the freedom of navigation in the Indo-Pacific, we've never had a greater need for uh, more innovation to be more pioneering. Which is why over the past two years, AUKUS uh, has been fusing together our transnational brain power. And here at the Defense Innovation Unit, uh, we've discussed the results, a raft of game-changing new AUKUS projects. Together, our nations will be launching and recovering undersea vehicles from torpedo, torpedo tubes uh, on current submarines. We'll be enabling us to deliver more sophisticated strike intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance. We'll be using quantum technologies, just mentioned, to support global positioning, enhancing the ability of our undersea capabilities, including on our future SSN AUKUS submarines, so they can stay silent and undetected. And sharing in not only all of this, not only with multiple undersea systems, but with our P-8A maritime patrol aircraft, strengthening our capacity to zero in on potential dangers. And I think the inventor of that artillery shell, Dr. Butman, would have been proud of what we've been talking about today. The man they dubbed at the time Mr. Searchlight Radar would have certainly appreciated another landmark agreement uh, that we are signing today because in the coming years our nations will be creating a global radar network bringing together three ground-based stations one in each of our countries radars more sensitive more accurate more powerful and agile than anything that has gone before giving us the ability to see beyond the clouds and to detect identify and track in space up to 22,000 miles away. Operational by 2029, that's this new initiative alongside AUKUS will not just help us to protect our communications and our navigation satellites from deadly threats of tomorrow, but will boost all three of our economies. Back in 1943, our brightest minds proved that geography was in fact no barrier uh, to our innovation as long as our values and our ingenuity was in close proximity. 
and 80 years on, inspired by the creators of that miraculous invention, our alliance is once again fusing our intelligence together, sparking new capabilities from sea to space and igniting the ideas that will change the course of our history. So Lloyd, Richard, that's why I've enjoyed our conversation so much this afternoon. We said we were going to uh, ensure that Pillar 2 was meaningful, that it would change the way that we work together, and today we've set that course. I'm delighted to be working with you both. Thank you. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Our first question will go to Associated Press, Alita Baldor. Hi, thank you. Uh, Lolita Baldor with the Associated Press. Um, to the two ministers, uh, you both talked a bit about uh, the, uh, the uh, various types of technology that you agreed on today, uh, the radars, the deep space improvements, and uh, we also heard about the sun boys. Can you tell us what specifically your countries are looking at in terms of what you think one of the top priorities is for improving your military capabilities through this, what would be something that you're really um, hoping to key in on, what, what aspect of it? And um, Mr. Secretary, for you, if you want to answer that question also, but a uh, separate question for you. Uh, today, um, the as you know, the, the truce uh, in Israel ended. Israel. Um, do you believe Israel has been taking the American warnings about civilian casualties seriously? Are you, or are you concerned that even hours after the truce ended, there were about 175 deaths already in Gaza? Uh, I'll start if you, uh, if, you, if you want me to lead with that uh, question on Israel. I just want to remind all of us how this started. October 7th, uh, Hamas launched a very brutal attack uh, into Israel, uh, took the lives of over 1,200 uh, Israelis, uh, took over 200 hostages, uh, which included uh, small children and Holocaust survivors. And, and so, um, we have said a number of times that uh, we will continue to support Israel's uh, right to defend itself. Now, I'll let Israel speak for, for uh, their own operations. What I, what I will tell you, Lita, is that, you know, I'm, I talk to Minister Gallant on a near daily basis, as you know. Uh, and each time I talk to him, I remind him of the uh, necessity to make sure that we're that they are protecting uh, innocent civilians and creating pathways and corridors for uh, civilians to uh, to move out of the out of the battle space. Uh, and they need to make sure that they're doing things to ensure civilian safety. Um, so that uh, that conversation is ongoing. Uh, on a near daily basis. Uh, we're going to continue to work with uh, uh, Israel and Egypt and, and Qatar on effort, uh, efforts to uh, re-implement the pause. And I think the pause, during the pauses, uh, you know, we've gotten some very meaningful things done in terms of a number of hostages out of, uh, uh, out of Gaza. Uh, plus, we've been able to introduce uh, a meaningful amount of humanitarian assistance. Uh, more needs to be done for sure, uh, but it's encouraging to see that w uh, we've been able to ramp up the amount that we've, uh, we've uh, moved into Gaza. Um, one of the conditions for uh, the pauses to continue, an Israeli condition, was that Hamas be able to provide uh, uh, at least 10 uh, hostages uh, for release uh, each day, and they've uh, at this point failed to produce names or, or hostages for you know upcoming days. And I would also remind you that that uh, we've seen things like uh, a brutal terrorist attack recently on the part of Hamas in Jerusalem. So Hamas has violated the the very conditions that uh, that they agreed to. So uh, again, 
this remains dynamic. We'll continue to do uh, everything we can to emphasize to uh, the Israelis the necessity to uh, operate uh, within a law of war, but also uh, protect civilians in the battle space. Uh, well, perhaps in answer to the, the first part of the, the question, um, Australia is a, um, an island nation which is uh, geographically relatively distant from um, uh, other parts of the world. And so our needs lie in maritime capabilities but long, longer range capabilities, um, capabilities which enable us to project. Um, and so having strike capabilities are really important um, and when you look at something like uh, resilient precision targeting, uh, which forms part of the announcements today, that is critically important. Uh, when you look at the maritime autonomy measures that are contained in the announcements today, that's hugely beneficial uh, for a, a country like Australia. I think the third area which is, which is covered by the specific uh, technologies which have been described in the announcements is decision advantage. You know, decision advantage in terms of the time it takes to make a decision in the battle space, but also the fidelity with which the fidelity of information that is there for the decision maker. Um, that's obviously critically important to any defence force as it is to ours. So when we look at the technologies that we are working on as three countries, they are highly relevant. Uh, to the specific needs of the Australian Defence Force. Uh, and to the same uh, question about which element of it, of course we've had nuclear subs uh, running for nearly six decades under the sea in the United Kingdom, nuclear arms arm as well. Um, so there are two things which are exciting. Well, there's a huge number to go after. Uh, artificial intelligence and autonomy, cyber, electronic warfare, hypersonic, counter-hypersonic capabilities, quantum technology, Embassy to name but a few simple answer to your question is it's hard to know which of those will end up being the most relevant, partly because you can't see the future, but partly, and I was reflecting our meeting, uh, given that uh, Kissinger has just uh, passed away, uh, he once remarked, no country can act wisely simultaneously in every part of the globe at every moment in time. Uh, and I was saying in our meeting, that's why three wise heads put together are surely better than one. I'm excited about all of these developments, but I can't tell you which one in the long run I should be most excited about today. That is the purpose of working together. Thank you. Our next question will go to Channel 9 News, Australia, Jonathan Kersley. Thank you very much, Brigadier General. Jonathan Kersley from Channel 9, Australia. Uh, Secretary's Minister, Deputy Prime Minister, thanks very much for your time today. I wanted to go to initially China's recent aggression in the Pacific. We've seen sonar attacks on Australian Navy divers. We've seen the Chinese Coast Guard vessels ramming into Philippine Navy vessels. Are these the types of issues, firstly, that need to be raised directly, leader to leader level? Uh, it, has it increased your need for urgency in formulating the August agreements, particularly around some of these aspects, uh, and increasing the urgency in bringing that partnership together a lot faster? And finally, if I may, AUKUS is an agreement that is designed to last. You described it as generational. Donald Trump is running for President of the United States. He's a man notorious for walking America away from key international agreements and has expressed his desire on a number of aspects around that. How concerned are you that AUKUS could be sunk if there's a change in American position? I'm confident that President Biden is going to win the next election, and uh, and I will remain confident of that. Uh, I would tell you that uh, what we're working on here is, uh, as you pointed out, a generational capability. Uh, we have common uh, goals and objectives. Uh, foremost among those goals and objectives is to uh, ensure that we maintain a free and open Indo-Pacific. Our values are, are, are similar, uh, and we have uh, long-standing working relationships with each other. I, I continue to see uh, bipartisan support in both chambers of Congress uh, for all this. Uh, and uh, it's that support that I think will for us uh, success going, uh, going forward. So uh, again, 
I'm very confident that we'll be able to work together on this very, very important issue. Uh, and, uh, and again, I think uh, both, all three of our countries uh, see the value in the you know, long-term capability that this is going to create for us. John, uh, to, um, to go to your first, the, the first part of your question, um, the um, incident that occurred on the 14th of November with HMAS Toowoomba um, was on the part uh, of the PLA Navy uh, unsafe and unprofessional. Um, and that is uh, a matter that we raised directly with China um, that we have made. It's important that we make this public and those representations have been made very clearly to China. In terms of the, you know, what does that say about the environment that we're operating in um, and the importance of um, moving at a pace in terms of our work? Uh, I mean, the answer is it, 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 it absolutely highlights the need for this arrangement and it absolutely highlights the need for speed in this arrangement and I think you can see that speed. I mean, when you look at where we were 12 months ago compared to where we are today, um, it is a huge leap forward um, in terms of the work that we've done on um, Australia acquiring a nuclear powered submarine capability, which for our country represents the, the biggest leap forward um, in military capability in more than a century. Um, and uh, you know, the fact that we've now been able to identify that pathway, that as I said earlier, we've, we've stood up the relevant agencies, we're seeing infrastructure work be commenced, um, our workforce being trained, uh, the visits happening, um, this is moving fast. But what does happen, uh, well firstly though, in terms of acquiring that capability, um, it will change the character of Australia in terms of what we are capable of doing. And that does not happen overnight. There is no showroom where you can go and uh, buy a, a Virginia-class submarine. We are acquiring the capability to operate and build nuclear-powered submarines in Australia. It will be the biggest industrial endeavour that we have ever undertaken as a nation, and it is not going to happen overnight. But I'll tell you what does happen overnight. Uh, the fact of the, our three countries standing here right now, uh, meeting in the way that we are, making the plans that we are making, and walking down this path together, represents an enormous deterrent effect immediately. It sends a very, very powerful message to the world and a very important message to the world. And as to the final part of your question, um, we are completely confident um, about um, the American system, as I might say we are about the British system and indeed our own, uh, for this reason, that across the three countries uh, there is bipartisan support for this arrangement. Um, that's actually what gives it power. By virtue of that bipartisan support across our three nations, we can confidently say uh, that when the three of us are not standing here at some point in the future and there are three other individuals, they will be pursuing the same objectives. And in respect of the US specifically, you know, I've had the opportunity um, of being uh, on Capitol Hill um, uh, in the last few weeks uh, to talk to lawmakers around uh, the legislation which is currently progressing through the US Congress. And as, as Lloyd has said, um, across the political spectrum there is uh, both a commitment to the alliance between Australia and the United States and support for it, there is commitment to AUKUS and the relationship between our three countries and you know, I think there is strong support for the specifics uh, which is in that legislative package. But that ought to give um, everyone in Australia an, an enormous sense of confidence that this is um, an arrangement uh, and a set of relationships which genuinely does enjoy support across the political spectrum in the US as I know it does in Britain and as it certainly does in Australia. Uh, I, actually I've been on uh, Capitol Hill unrelated in a separate visit uh, last month. Very, very uh, support for the AUKUS uh, and so I've every confidence uh, in, uh, as, as Richard says, in AUKUS uh, being for the very long term. On your actual point, navigation of the of the open seas under international law is something the United Kingdom takes incredibly seriously. Uh, we regularly, and consistently, are in the Indo-Pacific um, and will continue to be so. Uh, do so. Uh, we, we, we already announced plans to send our, our carrier strike group, led by the uh, Queen Elizabeth class, uh, uh, again uh, following a, a visit uh, previously. Uh, the the uh, uh, you know, be, be, be a very important 
um, in the context of August, actually, just to be absolutely clear that the, those international rules are there for a reason. You know, the, the UK London to the International Maritime Organization takes this particular right of free passage very, very seriously. August is a fantastic way to uh, make that clear to everyone. And just on that specific aspect, but do, do these incidents that occur in the South China Sea, uh, in the Pacific more broadly, do these need to be raised directly? Yeah, and, and, and actually there are, there, are all, there are always diplomatic processes to do that because, you know, same in the air uh, with, with, in, in other circumstances with, with Russia, for example. Uh, so the, these, these issues are always raised. There's a professional way to uh, behave and act in the air, in the sea, uh, and when countries breach those professional, professional, and it's a matter of professional pride for most navies, for one thing. Uh, and, uh, and we are absolutely call them um, out on it. But no one <laughs> should be under the impression that any of us are prepared to be kind of bullied out of waters, which are clearly international waters, for all to sail under international law. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Our final question will go to NBC News, Robert Handa. Happy to take the final question if it's been uh, thrown open, please. General, uh, can I can I ask uh, you, uh, Minister Miles? You say that this is moving fast. Uh, is it right that you've indicated today that an east coast base for the nuclear subs will not be selected to the end of, until the end of the decade? Uh, do we really need six years to make that decision? And are you kicking the can down the road on something that's politically difficult? Um, well, we've, we've, we've made that uh, position clear before today uh, that the timing in which to determine an East Coast base is uh, at the end of this decade. Um, and we, we, we made that clear at the time that we articulated the pathway by which Australia would acquire a nuclear powered submarine capability. I mean, it will be an important decision, but in the sequence of decisions that needs to be made, that's when, that's when it comes up. Um, and, uh, you know, there will be other decisions that need to be made, such as where we will locate uh, the place that we will ultimately dispose the nuclear reactors. That's clearly going to be a difficult decision, but in turn, that's a, a decision which comes later again. Um, what, so it, it, this is a matter of laying out the pathway and following it. Right here and right now, um, we are evolving an industrial capability to build nuclear-powered submarines out of the Osborn Naval Shipyard in Adelaide. We are evolving an operational capacity to operate and maintain nuclear-powered submarines out of HMAS Stirling uh, in Rockingham, south of Perth. Um, we have, you know, the, the first step was about having an increased number of nuclear powered submarine visits to uh, HMAS Stirling, which is happening as we speak. And as I articulated, you know, the next step in that will occur next year as a result of the meeting that we've had today. So each of these is about working through the steps of the pathway that we articulated last March. And um, the determination of the location for an East Coast base is going to be a big decision, but it's a decision which uh, is to be made in the late 2020s. And uh, we're going to work through each of the decisions as they come. Gentlemen, thank you so much. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes our press briefing.